Well, for me, it was basketball. I remember practices in basketball in high school that, particularly at the end of practice, after an already tiring and grueling, they were all grueling practices, because my coach was particularly joyous man. Um, <laughs> after the end of every practice, we did what we called, uh, what has been now named ladder sprints. So you stand at one end of the basketball court, and you look at the other end of the basketball court, the long ways, and you don't just run down and back. No, 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 that would be too simple. You first sprint to the free throw line, then you sprint back, then you sprint to the half court line, and then you sprint back, then you sprint to the other free throw line, then you sprint back, then you sprint to the other end of the court and sprint back. That's one ladder <laughs> drill, sprint. Oh, happy day. And, and so, the, and I swear, we would all, he would line up in a number of us, I think there was like 16,000 of us on the team, and we'd all line up and we'd have to shoot, and we'd shoot two free throws, and every one we missed was a ladder drill at the end of practice. A ladder sprint, I should say. And we're all already huffing and puffing, you know, and I'm just like, oh, and he always picked me, because I think he knew we would guarantee two ladder sprints, because <laughs> I'm going to miss both of them probably. And I remember doing these sprints, and several thoughts would come to my mind. One, what am I doing? I hate basketball now. Like, I, let me just, just keep running. Just run out the door and just run until you get home because it's going to be better than what you're experiencing right now. It's time to quit. Forget basketball. It's done, right? Throw in the towel, tapping out, whatever the phrase is. Another thought I had was um, I don't like my coach. He is not a nice man. Let's not invite him over for Thanksgiving dinner. He is particularly, I'm like, what? Wow. And in my more arrogant moments, I remember thinking, I sure would like to see him get down here on the court and do these sprints with us. Like, what? who does he think he is ordering us around? Now, the irony is, what a punk I was. <laughs> Maybe still laugh. The irony is, the guy had experienced a level of basketball play that I would only ever dream, I'm like, I could only dream of, and he endured far more practices, hundreds of more practices than I ever would. But here I am, this, you know, high school punk, get, get down here, I'd like to see him do this. <laughs> As we return to Hebrews, and today we're in Hebrews chapter 12, we're reminded of this group of people, this letter that is written to a, a group of Hebrew Christians, probably in Rome is, is a plausible guess, I guess. They're written to a group of Hebrew Christians that are undergoing immense trials and tribulations and difficulties and persecution. And they are so spiritually and emotionally fatigued and whipped and exhausted, they are they're like, I want to throw in the towel. And I know maybe some of you, by the way, for me it was basketball. Some of you may have been something like, you know, an instructor or a teacher or, a, you know, a, a, some of you probably wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares from a drill sergeant. I don't know. Um, and, and so, but we've all been there, maybe physically with some sports or some activity, but we've all been there emotionally and spiritually too, haven't we? And we, we can stand with these Hebrew Christians in some sense. Maybe the particulars are different, but we can stand with them. And yet, and there's times, and yet Hebrews, as we've talked about, whether it's chapter 10, it's this call to persevere, this, to have in chapter 11, that we're to have a persevering faith in the midst of our hardship. And all these examples that were given of these great men and women from the Old Testament that, that had a persevering faith. And it all leads to the verses that we read earlier. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race up before us, casting off the sin that so easily entangles, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, faith, <laughs> who for the joy set before him endured the cross on our behalf. Right? Isn't that great? And so we do this. And today, I want to continue with this next thought. The next few verses offer great hope and instruction, particularly for us, when, particularly when we're going through hard, difficult, challenging times. The instruction is to remember and to know that God loves, excuse me, God lovingly disciplines those he loves. God disciplines his children. 
Darrell, that doesn't sound very encouraging. I'm just going to be honest on the front end, but let's see what the text says. Because in doing so, in this passage, gives us three things. It gives us, one, a better perspective, a better discipline, and a better result. Okay? So read with me the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4. Um, we'll go through verse 6. Now, in your struggle, he says, the author writes to the Hebrew Christians, he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? For it says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So, this, it starts off with a better perspective. So they're sitting there thinking, man, I, I, this is hard stuff, and I can't catch a break, and you can't get ahead, and I just can't, it's got bad luck, and all this opposition, and I'm trying to follow Jesus, and all these sinful men who have not endured um, against sin. The, the context here is you've not resisted these sinful men to the point of shedding blood. He says, listen, I need you to have a different perspective. I need you to remember something. You... Have, you're spiraling. Yeah, you pause for just a minute. You haven't resisted the point to the point of shedding blood. It's not that bad. You think it's really bad. It's not. What does the immediate context tell us about this verse? It says you've not resisted the point of shedding blood. The verse before literally is talking about the one who did resist to the point of shedding blood, right? The scorn and the shame that Jesus experienced, the, the act of sinful men towards him, was what? To the cross. It's, it's, it's not that bad. It may get bad because Hebrews 11 points and Christ points that it may get bad, but for you guys right now, it's not. Hold up, just pause. Don't spiral. Just stop. Furthermore, Use a better perspective, a better view of things, is that you've forgotten something. You've forgotten what God's word says. And what does God's word says? As he quotes Proverbs chapter 3, he says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines who? The ones he loves. The ones he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So what the author's doing, he says, I want you to I want to reframe your view of what's really going on here. All this hardship and all this persecution and, and whatever it was, you need to reframe it as the loving act of your loving heavenly father. Right? Wow. And this word discipline, which is going to be repeated throughout, this word means it's it's like it's something we understand what it means, kind of. We understand it means a corrective action, right? It, it's, it's an instructional term. It's a corrective term. It's like God instructs, God corrects, God guides, God... And then the hard, the hard part of this verse is he chastens. And that, the King James, I believe, says he scourges. It's like, ooh, that speaks of like a corporal aspect. But God disciplines his own, his children, the ones he loves. And so this is God allowing things into these people's lives because he loves them. So they have a better perspective. Better perspective of what's going on. Furthermore, look at verse 7. Continuing on this thought, but adding to it, he says, Now endure hardship as discipline. So what you are facing is truly the discipline of God. Now let me pause for just a minute. When I think of discipline, I think of um, I did something wrong and I'm getting disciplined for it, right? That, that makes sense. Like if I sin against God, God has every right to discipline me. Let me help you, Daryl. You're getting off the rails. Let me bring some stuff into your life that's going to like, you know, maybe push you back towards me, towards the right path. That makes sense, right? But when I look at Hebrews, I'm, I, I get kind of nervous because I'm like, wait, wait, hold on. What they were facing wasn't necessarily because of they, were, they were sinning. It was just the act of sinful men against them. What? 
And then I remembered something. Now, my parents, fantastic parents, I love them that they did a great, well, they tried to do a really good job. They were very <laughs> consistent. <laughs> um, now, obviously, when I did something wrong, mom and dad were very consistent and very appropriate and loving in their discipline of me. And, you know, hey, D, let's, you know, let's move over here, you know. You thought you were going there this weekend, but you, you know, disobeyed me, disrespect your mom, whatever, there's consequences, right? That makes sense. But my father, I remember numerous times, and I talk about this in our household even today, he would, Saturday mornings, at a way too early of an hour, I would wake up to a pounding on my door. And it's like, D, wake up, because we got work to do. Now, I had done nothing wrong. Right? I didn't sin. This wasn't a punishment. It was simply, hey, let me, let me instruct you. Let me correct your view of what real life is like. That you, It's time to work. Let's go to work. This is, right? You get that. That's, a, that's discipline as well. Now, the beauty of this word discipline in this, in this passage is it is broad enough to, in, to encapsulate, to encompass both halves of that coin. So whether it is be God's corrective measures against, or, or not against us, for us in our sin, or if it's just something that he wants to bring into our lives to bring some growth and some change, that's what it's talking about. Either both of them are equally the, the love, the act of a loving God for our good, as the passage will be. So, um, so there's a better discipline, because further on it says, and he's going to move from the argument, it's going to move from lesser to greater here, and you'll, we'll follow this. It says in verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If, if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, let's be clear on that, everyone goes under, undergoes discipline, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father's spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. So you guys, we understand that. We've all had parents, and even if, and I need to be cautious here, your parental discipline could very well have been a labeled and rightly labeled as abuse, and that is wrong. That is obviously not what Scripture is talking about. But regardless, every single one of us has at least an understanding, both either it's experientially or at least, you know, theoretically, that proper discipline is good. So my mom and dad disciplined me, and I didn't like it, right? But as I've gotten older, I can look back and say, you know what, I'm glad they did. Right? We, we've all been there. We have, you have a kid, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry I ever treated you that way, because now I know what I was doing to you, right? You're like, <laughs> we get it. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, listen, we understand it here. How much more so with our imperfect parents who we turn to respect them? How much more so when we look to our Heavenly Father who is perfect, who is nothing but good, who absolutely loves us to the point that he would die for us, how much more should we not just submit to his discipline? See, that's a better kind of discipline. That's not just revenge or retribution or anything. That's not, nothing like that. It is the loving act of a God who wants to correct and guide us to what? Life and to his holiness. Every one of us in this room would want nothing more than to be more Christ-like, to be more holy, to righteous and, and pure and good and loving and gracious and do the right things. We all want that. And what? So God's discipline is Him helping us do that. God's word says, God says, be holy, for I am holy. His discipline is His loving correction to help us actually do that. So, better discipline. Now, verse 11. Oh, man. Verse 11. What a great verse. It says, Now, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Now, I love the honesty of the author right here, right? No discipline ever is fun. 
by design, right? You know, hey, don't lie. All you got, you lied. You know what? Have some cake. That doesn't really work, does it? Right? So no discipline is fun. It's painful. It hurts. However, see, this is the better result, by the way. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, what does it do? It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So this work of God, this discipline of God, it, it ain't fun. Anyway, shape or form, and anyone who says whatever, and by the way, we can ignore it as, as if it like, do not make light of the Lord's discipline previously. We can ignore it, and that doesn't do any good. We can be crushed by it, right? And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. No, we can do that, and that doesn't help anything. But if we allow God to work in our lives and we submit to his discipline, oh, later on, it's going to produce a better result, a better harvest. Now, the hard part is this word later on. <laughs> Because that's the hard part. That's the faith. This whole section's on faith, I believe. That in the middle of the hardship, in the middle of the discipline of God, I have to be able to step out in faith and say, God, this isn't fun. I'm trusting that you are doing something better in my life that makes that'll make this that this will make sense. Eventually. Does that make sense? Because later on, it's going to produce something. No fruit. Is produced overnight. It always takes time, and that's hard. But it produces the fruit of righteousness and peace. <clears throat> the righteousness is similar to the holiness that we talk about, the right living, the right um, actions, and, and the life that is in accordance in, in, to God's word and his perfection and his holiness, which brings peace, an inward peace. Now, if you're the Hebrew Christian going through persecution, would you characterize your life as being peaceful? No. It'd be turmoil. It'd be pain. It'd be like, ah, agony. They're really throwing the towel. I'm done with this Christianity thing. If this, I'm out. No, that's not peace, is it? But yet, if we submit to the loving work of our Heavenly Father, oh, it brings righteousness and peace in the midst of all the hardship. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Three things come to mind. One, read. That may sound a little weird. So the Hebrew Christians had kind of forgotten something. And what did they forget? He refers them back to Proverbs. He refers them back to God's Word. One of the things we can do as we face hardship is to read God's Word. So that's, that's contrary to what we, well, at least what I want to naturally do. When I'm going through hardship, the, I, I don't want to read God's Word. I just want to re, you know, escape into something else. I want to do something, anything else. But what I need to be doing is saturating my heart and my mind with the truth of God's Word. So maybe it's simply, you know what? I'm going to read the book. I'm going to start in Psalm 1, and I'm going to read through the Psalms. I'm going to read a Psalm in the morning. I'm going to read a Psalm at night. Maybe it's a... Maybe it's morning, noon, and I don't know. Just take the time to read God's word and remember what he has said. Remember who he is, his, his character, his love, his grace, his power, his sovereignty, his, his presence, his... Second, not only should we read, read God's word, I think it would do well, at least for me, when I'm going through hardship and I'm... I need to suspend judgment. Because when hardship comes on my life, whether it's big or small, I can all too quickly judge God by what I'm walking through. And I think we would do well to just pause and suspend judgment for a bit. Because here it says, later on, Later on, it produces. Like in the middle of my hardship, I'm not seeing things clearly. I'm not understanding, right? My perspective's off and whatever. And so I don't want to, maybe I should just pause, suspend judgment and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you that you are good even when things are hard. That you do still love me even when 
the hardest things are entering into my life. That I can still follow you. And you are doing something that I may, I don't know if I understand, but I want to suspend judgment. Third thing is, third thing is, read, suspend judgment. Third, lay it down. And by lay it down, I mean ask for forgiveness. Lay down our expectation that following Jesus means everything is going to be easy and comfortable. <coughs> lay down our whining, lay down our, our complaining, lay down our, lay it down on the ground and say, you know what? I'm sorry that's wrong because God, you are my king. You are my heavenly father who has full authority and right over my life. No, I can trust it. We lay down all the stuff that we saw. I mean, I, I'm, I'm right here with you guys. <laughs> Whine and complain and, oh, I must be doing it. I just can't catch a break and I just can't. And it's so bad. Oh, I'm not. Nope. Maybe it's the act of a loving God on my behalf trying to do something good in my heart because he knows something about me. So I lay down my expectations. Because the beauty of it all is, is that I can look at this passage, and the passage we're going to talk about next week, and the passage we just read this morning, I'm speaking of Jesus who endured the cross, the beauty of it all is that Jesus, he did enter into our realm. <laughs> he got down on the court and started doing the ladder sprints with us, didn't he? Yes. Right? And so when I think, I would, I'd like to see you get down, well, he did. And what did Jesus do? He ran it perfect. And he ran it sinlessly. He didn't complain, and he didn't sin, and he didn't try to escape into some vice, and he didn't, what, no, no, what did he do? He faithfully followed and obeyed his Heavenly Father to the point of dying on the cross for you and for me. So everything we've talked about in the previous weeks, the victory that we have, the victory that we have over sin, the ability to have a persevering life, persevering faith that can trust God in the midst of hardship is because he ran the race perfectly on our behalf. He died on the cross. So it's Christ working in me. It's by his power, his presence in my life that I can say, okay, you know what, God, I trust you. Hardship, discipline, I don't like it, I don't want it, and it can end tomorrow, and I'll be really happy. But whatever you want, God, I'm following you. And in doing so, I have the assurance, I have the confidence that, A, I am your child because you love and discipline your child. There's a beautiful, subtle assurance, by the way, nestled in here. And I have the confidence that you're leading me to your return, to life with you, eternal life. That's right. So, Heavenly Father, all we can do this morning, again, is to say thank you. We recognize you as our King and our Lord because of who you are, and we recognize your grace and your mercy because of what you've done on our behalf. God, this week, may we do, may we find ourselves in your word, and may we find ourselves suspending judgment and trusting in who you are, and may we find ourselves simply laying down our complaints and our whining to pick up the light that you have for us. We love you, Jesus, and it is your holy and eternal name that we pray. Amen.